Enjoying yourself? Well, I watch. That's what Formula One is. A dream come true. The cars are boys' toys in a big way. Million dollar micro models that you can actually get into before you run them into each other and your mother can't make you stop. For the spectators who wish they were doing it, but are secretly glad they aren't allowed to, the first impression of a Formula One race is of a blur that screams. Bumper cars gone bananas, a bobsleigh battle with asphalt for ice. It takes time to sort out that these hurtling machines have drivers inside them who don't want to stop doing this, but want to go on doing it, no matter what happens, and a lot can. A car that cost a fortune can convert itself to scrap iron in a split second. While the bit the driver sits in is so strong nowadays that he's hard to hurt, the rest of the car is all too eager to spread itself around the landscape. But it isn't enough for the driver to keep his car and himself in one piece. He has to do that going faster than anyone else. If he can, he emerges at the end of the season as world champion. He came late to Formula One, but in only four seasons he has lived the complete experience from nowhere to the pinnacle. Will you welcome the reigning world champion, Damon Hill. Well, it's been quite a year, hasn't it? It's a bit of an understatement, I think, Clive. It's uh, certainly been... Uh, a year that uh, had everything packed into it, yeah. And you snatched victory from the jaws of almost not victory. But it's, uh, it's like that all the way through a season, you know, there's, there's always plenty of opportunity to let it slip, and, uh, uh, but the tension made it all more worthwhile, I think, when it came off. Well, that's what I was most impressed by, the way you hold up under pressure, I'm bound to say. Well, you can't answer that, that's a compliment. <laughs> okay, I won't answer that, I'll accept it. <laughs> How has it affected your life, being champion? Um, I've, I've sort of learned how to receive awards, I think, is uh, one of the things that I've been doing a lot. And uh, I've, um, I've been absolutely spoiled everywhere I've gone, and people have been fantastic to me, and uh, it's been absolutely amazing. Last year, Williams not renewing your contract was very public. Did you feel bitter about that at times? I don't think I really had time to feel any bitterness. I uh, was in the middle of trying to win the championship, so I kind of pressed on regardless and uh, put it behind me. Well, Patrick Head is one of the team bosses at Williams, is actually here tonight. Now's your chance to, to have a word with him. <laughs> but, would you like to say something to Patrick? Hello, Patrick. <laughs> Miss me? <laughs> Patrick Head, have you got anything to say to David? Uh, no, I just wish him all the best for 1997. <laughs> Hello, Dem. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, I, think, I think the warmth is so touching. Okay. <laughs> How's it been working with Tom Walkinshaw and, and the Arrows team? It's been, it's been very good so far. We're hard pushed, uh, working very, very hard to get things ready and uh, they're very professional and doing a great job at the moment. Well, if I said, did you, do you seriously think you can win again? That would be an insult to the team. But do you think you can win again? Well, I have no doubt that I can win again. It's uh, just a matter of when. And uh, that's, that's the unknown factor at the moment. And how long are you going to give it? How long have you got? <laughs> as long as it takes, I think. Well, Damon, development driving is one of the things you do brilliantly well, so Arrows is lucky to have you, so good luck with the season. Thank you very much. There was twice as much out there. Ratings, bonanza, so much more to enjoy. It's really <laughs> this week. Damon won't be the only driver on the track in 1997. Let's meet some of the others. Driving for Williams, Jacques Villeneuve from Canada. Last season was his first season in Formula One and he almost picked Damon for the championship. Driving the other Williams, Heinz Harold Frensen from Germany. Heinz cool customer taking over Damon's hot seat. Driving for McLaren, David Coulthard from Scotland. Very quick in the car and very charming out of it, helped by that square-jawed, radiant smile. Driving the other McLaren, floppy-haired Mika Hakkinen from Finland. Hurt badly in Adelaide at the end of the season before last, but he's come all the way back. 
Driving for Sauber, Johnny Herbert from Britain. He's won Grand Prix races before, but has his car got as much fizz, verve and grit as he has? Driving the other Sauber, Nicola Larini from Italy. A talented driver long in search of a car that will go. Copes well with being called Nicola. Pedro Diniz is Damon Hill's teammate at Arrows. He comes from one of Brazil's wealthiest families and he's doing an increasingly good job of living down his image as a rich boy who can buy a ride. Driving for Tyrrell, Jos Verstappen from Holland, a country previously famous for Rembrandt, Vermeer and Van Gogh, none of whom could drive a racing car. Driving for Minardi, Ukio Katayama from Japan, sometimes performs so brilliantly during the race that he is allowed to leave early. To thousands of Japanese would-be drivers, Kata is their Damon Hill. Vincenzo Sospiri was a star in kart racing and Formula 3000. Now he's in Formula 1, driving a brand new Lola that might need everything he's got. Driving for Jordan, Giancarlo Fisichella. He's been working on his English all winter, and he can already say, Madam, what you are proposing is physically impossible in my overalls. Driving for Stewart, Rubens Barrichello from Brazil, where the fans loudly expect him to be the next Ayrton Senna, and he could do it if he had a fast car. Will the new Stewart be it? Driving the other Stewart, Jan Magnussen from Denmark. No relation to Magnus Magnussen except for his motto, I've started, so I'll finish. Okay, Jacques Villeneuve, your tip for world champion this year, what's going to stop you? Well, there's a lot of people that are going to try. Uh, Heinz to start with, and Michael with Ferrari, then both uh, David and Mika with the McLaren, the two Benetton drivers, and all the other guys. Everybody's going out there to, to try and get the best result. And uh, they're going to get closer this year than they were last year, so the competition should be good. We, our car last year was very, very good, and it's going to be difficult to improve it. Everybody in Formula One says that the Williams could win with your grandmother driving it, so where does that leave the driver? Well, in the back seat. <laughs> Last year you were Damon's problem, and this year Heinz Harold could be yours. Are you bothered by that? No, I hope I hope he's going to be a bother because uh, racing without competition would be boring. Heinz Harold, uh, you're in Damon's seat at Williams, and a lot of people think that he should never have lost it. That makes you the bad guy. Are you coping with this? <laughs> well, first I have to say I'm very delighted to drive for Williams, and uh, another thing I have to say that Damon has done uh, a very good job in the past years. And uh, winning the world title, world championship last year, was evident enough. Are you two speaking, but by the way? <laughs> David and Heinz Harold? He didn't answer yes. the question, did he? <laughs> we have another guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's... Uh, um, I don't know. It's, um, it could be that uh, the people are throwing with tomatoes at me. <laughs> <laughs> Here in England. But um, anyway, I have to say that um, um, Damon has done a good job. That's all I can say. And uh, Mika Hakkinen. Mika, it's your fifth year at McLaren. Is this the year for you and the team? Well, I thought my year's going to be already 93, and it still really hasn't happened. But I, I believe uh, and testing what we have done so far has been uh, quite encouraging. So I believe this year is going to be a good year. So I hope that means we're going to win some races. Johnny, you couldn't even walk when you started driving in Formula One because your legs have been smashed up in Formula 3000. Why did you go on? Um, I think it was just basically that I had that enthusiasm to get back into racing and I knew that if I tried hard enough and tried to, my, my best to get the fitness back and getting the mobility back in the feet, that I could give it another go. If I failed at that, at least I, inside I knew I gave, gave it my best shot of actually getting back into, into racing in Formula One. Ukyo Karayama. Hajime Mashti, Katayama-san. Tozo, Yorosko. Ukyo, in your first Formula One season, you had three shunts. In your second, you had four. In your third, six. And in your fourth, seven. <laughs> what are your plans for this season? I, mean, I didn't know, so you were counting. Counting <laughs> number of my shunts. Uh, uh, don't try to upset Giancarlo Minari. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, of course, I try to finish all races. <laughs> Just for Stappen, you've got a reputation for being very fast, but also uh, trifle hair raising. Now you've got a good driver, Tyrrell. Are you planning to calm down your act a bit? Um, certainly, we had, we had a lot of problems um, during the years I'm in Formula One. I uh, had a few crashes, that, that's right. But it was not always my fault. Um, 
But I must say, uh, for sure, I'm, I'm trying to finish all the races what I can. But it, uh, I try it many times. But uh, sometimes you, uh, you go off and it's not your fault. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, your team boss, Ken Tyrrell, is in the audience. Ken Tyrrell, what are you going to do to calm your boy down? We had Jost at Silverstone today on a wet track and we didn't need to calm him down. I thought every lap he went out on looked like a qualifying lap. And uh, he looks good to me. That's inspiring leadership, Ken. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dan Magnuson, when you drove in Formula 3, you were seen as being a Formula 1 champion of the future. But now you're actually in Formula 1. You're, you're chiefly famous for not caring very much about fitness and being a heavy smoker. Now, Jackie Stewart has announced he's going to put you on the straight and narrow. Do you think he'll be able to reform you? I'm sure he's going to try. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, <laughs> as you know, Jackie Stewart is here tonight. He's sitting in the audience. Jackie, are you going to impose your will on this boy? To say the very least, uh, uh, I don't think it's going to take much will. I, in fact, if it gets really difficult, I'll give them to Paul. Uh, that's what delegation is. Right. So you just tear the cigarettes from his hand, is that it? Yeah. No, I think he's going to want to do it, Clive. I think he's hungry. I think he knows this is a big opportunity for him. He's going to need his fitness and he's going to have to breathe at the same time. Well, if people are hungry, they smoke, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> Pedro Diniz, oh, you come from a wealthy background. Your family owns the Brazilian equivalent of Sainsbury's. Is being rich a help when you're trying to break into Formula One? <laughs> when you are in the car driving, doesn't matter if you have money or if your family has money. Uh, you need to drive and you need to drive by yourself. Doesn't matter really. Giancarlo Fisichella, last year you got bounced from the Minardi team because they ran out of money and they needed a driver with some of his own. How hard is it to keep going in Formula One without cash behind you? It's nearly impossible. You need money or you need uh, luck. I was lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Rubens Barrichello, you're a Brazilian and the nation's eye is on you to carry the mantle of Ayrton Senna. Do you feel the pressure of that? Well, it's been very difficult to begin with. 94, 95 was uh, very, very difficult. But I think, I think I've coped quite well with that pressure. And, uh, you know, beginning a new career with uh, the Stuart Four team, it's, uh, it's a new life for me. When I go to a Grand Prix, I can't help noticing the one thing that never changes. The paddock is still full of pretty women. Uh, Giancarlo, the female readers of F1 Racing Magazine elected you as number one on their list of the top ten sexiest drivers. Now, do you find the abundance of female attention distracting? No, I have a girlfriend. <laughs> so... When I am in, uh, at races, uh, I'm, I just concentrate, concentrate to my, on my job. Ah. <laughs> Johnny. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Johnny, this list of the top ten sexiest drivers, you aren't even on it. What went wrong? <laughs> I think you're sexy. Which magazine was it? This is F1. You want a copy? I've got it here. No, no, no. Oh, it's, very, it's hardly any sold of that magazine, I think. Um, it's a shame for me. <laughs> um, again, I don't notice these sort of things because I'm dedicated to my job. I, I'm a, I've been a TV viewer and fan of Formula One for a long time, and I've watched it evolve. And I think with Ayrton Senna, there's a big, deep, question that goes to the heart of the sport for me. With Ayrton Senna, he was a great driver, but he brought in the attitude that sportsmanship meant nothing and you should do anything the rules allow in order to win, up to and including pushing the other guy off the track. Now, was he right, Jacques? Well, I'm not sure he started that, um, but no, I don't think it's right when you race like that. Uh, you're still human beings in there and uh, there's right and wrong. And I, I believe the respect is the most important thing and a lot of times people ask you, do you hate the other opponents? Opponents, do you have to hate them to, to race well? And I think the best racing is in between friends when you know there's a huge amount of uh, respect. Well, uh, Damon, at the end of Japan, at the end of the last season, uh, all you had to do was crash into Jacques 
and take them both out of the race and the championship would have been yours. Did you, ever, did you consider it? Well, yeah, that was my plan initially, was to crash into <laughs> it. Uh, I didn't give he, him the chance. But he made I such a poor start, start. <laughs> I couldn't see him. <laughs> so the thought never really crossed your mind? Huh? Only for about three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, I'm going to uh, thank you at that point, but stick around because there's a lot more to do and a lot more to say about Formula One. Thank you very much, the drivers. <laughs> Welcome back to Formula One. Under all the money, hype, noise and high-tech talk, Formula One is simple, and it's been simple since Ben Hur drove a Formula One chariot. But there's no denying that in its modern form, Formula One looks complicated. For example, restrictions on fuel and wear and tear on tyres compel pit stops. How many pit stops is a matter of strategy and how fast the pit stop is can make the difference between winning and losing. Constant drill by the pit crew can get the pit stop time down to a few seconds as the Williams team demonstrate. After the car goes up on the jack, all four wheels are changed while the fuel tank is filled again under pressure with up to 80 litres of highly flammable juice. If the whole job takes longer than nine seconds, it's a slow stop. But sometimes things go wrong and we're given a not-so-gentle reminder that a racing car isn't just a multi-million dollar jigsaw puzzle, it's a magic lantern whose genie is just burning to be let out. Just for Stapp and you were in the middle of all that, could you feel the heat? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> no, you could feel the heat very, very easily and as well because I had, my visor was a bit open and the fuel came inside the helmet. So when the fire was there, it was all very warm and hot and... But I must say, in, in a couple of seconds everything was solved and you got out of the car and basically that was it. Well, pit stops are just one example of how it helps to know what's involved. Some of my questions have been answered, and I'm sure there are members of the audience here tonight who are just as keen to hear further fascinating Formula One facts from those who know. Any questions? Roger Cook. I know it sounds trite, Clive, but uh, like you, I harboured a boyhood desire to be a racing driver. What was against me, I think, was too much bulk and not enough latent talent. <laughs> but is that why these guys are here? Is this the realisation of a boyhood dream? Well, maybe, Jacques, can I ask you that? Is well, that what you wanted to do when you were a boy? As far as I can remember, yeah. Um, it's not that it was a dream, uh, because I was growing up in that world. So to me, it, it was more a question of, oh, one day I'll be doing it. So I just took it out of my mind and never thought about it again. But skiing is what you did seriously when you were a kid, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, first of all, because uh, nobody would bring me to the go-kart. And once my father died, my mother didn't want to be a mechanic. So uh, <laughs> skiing was easier. Yeah. Ukyo, did you want to be a, a racing driver when you were a kid? Uh, yeah, I want to be, I wanted to be an explorer or mountain climber. Ah. <laughs> so what went wrong? Not enough mountains in Japan? Yeah, so I need a long time to explain why I'm here. Honor Blackman. Why are there no women drivers in Formula One? It's a good question. Damon, what's the answer? Um, there were some women driver. There was a couple of attempts, but uh, they didn't. They didn't seem to make uh, make it through. And I don't know it's a very male-dominated environment. But there should really be a women's category for racing. I guess is the answer. I mean, you have women's tennis and women's golf, and it is very physical. So um, there are women are at a disadvantage on a strength uh, level. But uh, they they shouldn't be uh, rally. There have been very many successful rally uh, women drivers. Mika, what do you think? Uh, Damon said already quite a lot, but I think it would be, I think it would be really to have something uh, more prettier in Formula One than this race. <laughs> <laughs> but Carol Smiley. Do any of the guys have any pre-race superstitions? What about you, David? You got any pre-race superstition? I always get in the car from the, from the, um, can't remember. <laughs> I always get in the car. <laughs> no, I always get in the car from the right-hand side, and that's right. just because I dress to the left, and it's important to get the seatbelts in the right. <laughs> yeah, what about you, Johnny? Well, I'm getting much quicker. 
um, and I get him from the left, but it's not a superstition I have, it's actually a mechanic because uh, we had a good qualified session and uh, I did it from the left hand side, so he always now makes me go in from the left hand side, so I do. David, there's something you're not telling us here. There's a rumor that you, you wear a special color underwear and never any other kind. Well, um, no, it's actually an auntie bought me when I was younger uh, a three-pack of underpants that were very comfortable. So I, uh, I lost one pair, but then I used to always wear the other two pairs. One, one pair one day, of course, and then the second pair. But unfortunately, um, the typical thing where your mother says, you know, you should always have a clean pair of underpants in case you're in an accident. It actually happened in Spa in 1990 when I had a crash and uh, I broke a bone in my leg and I remember it well because actually Jackie was there, my mother was there, and my father, and of course my mother's in a terrible state because I'm lying there hurt and they uh, cut the race suit from me and my pants had been, I had them for five years so they had uh, holes in them. So my, my uh, privates were sticking out so it was a bit embarrassing. So I, I, I don't wear them anymore but I still take them. <laughs> they travel with me. When I think of all the mercy packages of underwear that are going to be on their way to Monaco tomorrow, <laughs> Mary Nightingale. I was wondering, Clive, is it an advantage to be small? Well, I'm going to start with you, Damon, because you aren't. You've got size 11 and a half feet, which I can't help noticing there. And, uh, <laughs> are you the ideal size for a racing driver? Should they have scaled you down? No, I, ideally, I would have been. Uh, I could have been smaller. Um, I'm on the limit, really, both with my feet, which are 11, not 11 and a half, just a little. Point there. Um, but on the height size, I have to uh, I have to really sit low in the car to uh, you know if I'm scrunched up, I'm a little bit more uncomfortable than I would be if I was shorter. Jacques, you're you're sort of compact, aren't you? Yeah, right well, size? it used to be a big advantage because you didn't add weight to the car. So being smaller, usually you weigh less. Where now you add weight to the car, but you still can't reach the pedals. Yeah. <laughs> There's a question from Andrea Boardman. What do your wives and girlfriends think about you being a racing driver? This is a good one for you, Jacques. What does Sandrine think? Well, she, she used to have no clue what racing was about, and at least now she understands. Um, but, she, she, no, she doesn't like it. She doesn't like the risk. Uh, she thinks it's more dangerous than it actually is. Chris Barry. Yes, uh, do you know what's going on elsewhere in the race, even though you can't see it? Rubens. The radio on. Yeah, put the radio. <laughs> if, um, you, uh, how much can you hear on that radio? Can they tell you everything on the radio? Well, you can hear all, always. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can hear. <laughs> so I actually lost uh, uh, a podium finish because I crashed with Mika. And uh, it was the last lap. I didn't know. The, it was very noisy. I couldn't see the board because the board was on the, you know, 10 meter, meters from, from breaking point. And I went into the, uh, to the pit. He overtook me again. Uh, that was a pity. <laughs> Katayama san, I hesitate to ask you this, but do you always know where you are? <laughs> I didn't understand. You always know what's going on in the race? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah I think it's easy to understand by the radio. John McCreary. What I'd like to know, lads, is those little signs they hold out from the pit, from the pit lane, how can you read them? Surely tic-tac would be better. You'd be read, understand the tic-tac far easier. Yeah. Because we're going flat out. Can you actually read the signs, Jacques? Yeah, you, you do. Uh, you get used to it. You, you know what to look for. Uh, and, the, and it depends on the color that's on you. You have to ask for something that really grabs your eye because the problem is you read the other people's board and you always miss yours. <laughs> I can't help noticing you're wearing windows over your eyes at the moment. Well, you, you drive in contacts, don't you? No, I don't wear anything, because if I see too much, I'm afraid to get scared. I don't wear anything. <laughs> Gentlemen, this has been powerfully interesting stuff, and I'd like to thank you, and especially I'd like to thank the members of the audience who put the questions on behalf of us all. Thank you all very much.